um, during Camille's presentation actually reminded me that my um, first relationship with the research corporation Cottrell Scholars was during the new faculty workshop. Um, I have been at UCSD for only two and a half years. Uh, I teach a enormous Gen Chem class as uh, my undergraduate class um, with at least 200 students. About 80% of them are pre-meds and about 100% of them don't want to be there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I attended the new faculty workshop actually at the end of my first year and um, the difference in my CAPE evaluations was extraordinary. Uh, CAPE evaluations is what the, the undergraduates fill out at the end of our course and say if they would recommend you as an instructor or not. It's quite terrifying. But so my CAPE evaluations actually jumped from 72% to 87% in large part thanks to the new faculty workshop. Um, so that was awesome. And so I, I'm currently in the middle of my, my third attempt at teaching this course right now. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, anyway, so um, I had the opportunity of attending the Chemical Machinery of the Cell Scilog this past October. And I was awarded a grant through the Betty and Gordon Moore Foundation. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about um, very briefly today. Um, it's on a topic that I never would have ever attempted this project without this funding. And um, we actually just received final word that we got the funding a few weeks ago. So I don't have much data here. But uh, bear with me. Um, I, I, am, I, am, I am trained as a chemist. And I ended up in the genome editing field somehow. And so I develop precision genome editing tools. And then we use them to better understand uh, human genetic variation. And so one thing that I'm very interested actually is, um, but I've never actually worked on before, is this huge red portion of our genome. Um, it's sort of called the dark matter of the genome. It's the portion of our genome that doesn't encode for proteins, OK? Um, and a lot of times, so some of this is our introns and like long non-coding RNAs. Um, um, but actually, there are a lot of uh, point mutations that are identified in people that occur in this area of the genome. And it's really sort of puzzling to figure out what they're doing and why they're important. Why do we even have all this area of our genome? Um, and so uh, in particular, let's say um, this is a gene of interest. Um, you can have these mutations occurring completely outside of the gene of interest, maybe even in the middle of intronic regions of neighboring genes. And it's actually been shown that this will affect expression levels of this particular gene, even though sometimes they're tens of thousands of base pairs away. Okay. Um, and so as I mentioned, I develop um, these new precision genome editing tools that allow us to introduce specifically point mutations with very high efficiency. So um, a lot of people have heard about CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and this has certainly revolutionized the field, but the way that these tools work, and these are the tools that most typical scientists know how to use, simply cut the DNA at a particular site and then try to manipulate DNA repair to introduce the point mutation of interest, and they're incredibly inefficient. And so the tools that we develop can actually introduce point mutations with about 100-fold higher efficiency than just traditional CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and so basically what we wanted to understand is how are mutations in these non-coding regions that are tens of, sometimes hundreds of thousands of base pairs away from a particular gene of interest uh, modulating expression levels. Um, and so, you know, at the chemical machinery of the cell, Scilog, um, I met with a bunch of people from a variety of different backgrounds. And we had some really awesome discussions. And one of the sort of topics that was permeating um, the, the conference was this idea of the 3D structure of the genome. And so um, if you kind of pull the DNA, your gen genomic DNA apart, it's, it's enormous. It's really, really long. And it has to compact into your nucleus. And, um, and it's not random. So it folds up in particular three-dimensional structures. And these are usually, if you have a ton of different cells and you're looking at how the genome is sort of folded up across different cells, it's, it, it happens, it's not random. It's over and over again. It's, it's similar in each cell. 
Um, so the 3D structure of the genome is, is not random. And also you can see in s somewhere like this, you can have two areas of the genome that are, you know, tens or hundreds of base pairs apart from each other in terms of the actual sequence of the genome, but they're physically very close together. Um, and so a few of us kind of put this together with this idea of, you know, mutations in these regions affecting gene expression, and we said, well, maybe this is expecting, uh, affecting gene expression by altering the 3D structure of the genome, okay? Um, but again, how is this happening? How would mutations in these non-coding regions affect folding up of the three-dimensional structure of the genome? And so uh, we focused on um, these regions uh, called ultra-conserved elements. Um, and so here's an example of one. Um, there's this ARX gene, which is a transcription factor, and it's involved in uh, neurodevelopment. And there, and shown in blue here, are these four ultra-conserved regions. And so they vary um, in distance from this protein of, or this gene of interest. Um, you know, some of them are very, very close. This one's very, very far away. But what they all have in common with each other is that they're in non-coding regions of the genome, not even in intronic regions. And the sequence is 100% conserved between human, mouse, and rats. Okay. And so our hypothesis was that, um, you know, these sequences are so well conserved because they're very important, okay? And they're so important because they could be modulating this sort of three-dimensional structure of the genome, okay? And that's uh, affecting expression levels of this ARX gene. Which again, this is a transcription factor, so its expression levels are then going to go modulate uh, all of the different genes that this is a transcription factor for, all the other genes where it's binding. And so previous work had been attempting to sort of understand how these regions affect ARX gene expression, and they always use CRISPR-Cas9 to just chop out humongous chunks of the genome. Okay. And this is very highly perturbative. They would chunk, they would cut out, you know, like 2,000 base pairs out of the genome and say, oh yeah, it's changing something. Well, of course, that's an enormous thing to do to the genome. Um, and so uh, my component of this project is um, to sort of take these little ultra-conserved regions and instead of just cutting out humongous chunks of the genome, install point mutations there. All right, so again, these sequences are 100% conserved from us to rat to mouse. They're obviously very important. And so if we could just change a single AT base pair to a GC base pair, we're altering the sequence, but we're doing so in a very, very small manner. And, and so we can do this in live cells and then, uh, and then look at expression levels of ARX. We can also use some of these uh, techniques called high c where you can look at the three-dimensional structure of the genome and see how we're changing it. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, this is uh, Davide from UC Davis. I met him at the Scilog. He's a computational chemist. And so what he's going to do is uh, take the point mutations that we're introducing in our lab and we can see, oh yeah, this is modulating expression levels. He's going to do this coarse grain uh, modeling of the sequence of the genomic DNA and see how point mutation would modulate the 3D structure just from a purely sequence perspective. Um, and then uh, Ronit Friedman is at UNC Chapel Hill. She is a specialist in nanomaterials and particularly DNA origami. And so what she can do is take, let's say this is a piece of DNA. Um, this is shown circular, but just bear with me here. Um, she can design these sort of staple strands or tiny pieces of DNA. We call them skewers also. And using um, base pairing, they can skewer the DNA into a particular 3D structure by sort of stapling the sequence here to there. And so based off of uh, Davide's computational work and our experimental work with the high c we could then take the wild type sequence and staple it into the same 3D structure that those point mutations that we introduced were altering the structure. And we can see if that is then uh, consequently resulting in same modulation of expression levels of this ARX gene. Um, and so with that, that's, that's it. That's what we're doing. We haven't started yet. Um, 
But I have a, my grad student, Ashley, is super excited to start. Um, and again, this is, you know, it's something that I've always thought about are these non-coding mutations, and I really wanted to dive into them and understand them. But um, it's not in the area of my expertise, so I've never done it before. And so this is a totally new area, and I think it's going to be really awesome. And thank you for, for your kindness and your, and your money, which is coming in soon. And hopefully I'll have, I'll have some updates for you by the end of the year. Certainly by the next dialogue.